Hi, everyone. So um, we changed our title, as you occasionally do, and we made it a little bit more provocative, um, as you can tell. But we did that for a reason. Hopefully, that reason uh, becomes clear in a couple of minutes. So the new title is, of course, a reference to one of the most cited papers to come out of digital art history, uh, Johanna Drucker's paper, Is There a Digital Art History? with a question mark. And in that text, Johanna Drucker suggests that there's an important difference between what she calls digitized art history and digital art history. And she argues that there's not been a research breakthrough so far, and we have yet to witness, quote, a convincing demonstration that digital methods change the way we understand the objects of our inquiry. In other words, um, or in Drucker's uh, perspective, while we can always have more convenience through digitization, a digital art history that enables new kinds of questions, right, um, has yet to emerge. And what we would like to uh, attempt in the next 20 minutes or so is to revisit Drucker's famous distinction a decade later, precisely, um, and ask, is there a digital art history? Finally, and again, the title gives it a little bit away, right? We, we kind of think there is, um, but we'll qualify that in a, in a second. So, Johanna Drucker's argument, of course, mirrors um, what we could think of as the fundamental methodological question of the digital humanities in general, right? What is the surplus value of the digital? Uh, and one answer, of course, um, epitomized in the notion of distant reading or distant viewing, as, as Lauren Taylor would probably call it, is scale. But at the same time, those works in digital art history that have focused on intrinsically really large-scale problems, uh, for instance, Matt Lincoln, the networks of early modern Dutch and Flemish printmaking, they've tended to do so outside the realm of the image itself, outside the realm of the digital image. Visual digital art history, um, on the other hand, in the past decade has been arrested by a very basic question, um, which turned out to be also a significant technical challenge, and that is, what is in an image, right? So what, what is there in an image to see? The primary reason for this divergence of digital art history and the digital humanities in general um, lies in what we could call maybe the Laocoon problem of computation. So the affordances of images are different from the affordances of text. Now this seems very trivial, but uh, bear with me here uh, for a second. So there's no equivalent right, to the discrete tokens of text-based digital approaches in the visual domain. Most texts have a clearly defined vocabulary, um, some number of words or subwords with a reasonable upper bound. In images, potential vocabularies, if we even want to use that term, are ambiguous, infinite, and not tied to any common superset. And even if they share a common vocabulary, for instance, if you think about iconographic vocabulary, if you want to call it that, um, no instance of a word is like the other. Um, another example would be right, sentences um, or other high-level structures in text. Sentences end with a period, but how do image, like, where do image objects end exactly, right, down to the pixel level? And the ingenuity of early approaches like that of Lefmanovich, for instance, right, is to sidestep this question completely. Um, digital images are pixels, and pixels have measurable properties like color, brightness, and entropy. So the challenges for digital art history um, are different and perhaps a little bit uh, even more fundamental from those in other branches of the age. So Joanna Drucker's question um, arguably still stands 10 years after it was first proposed. But what we would like to suggest is that a truly digital art history um, is at the very least on the horizon. And it emerges, this is the argument that we would like to make, from a necessary entanglement of data analysis and model critique in contemporary multimodal models. So machine learning systems that are trained on both textual and visual data. So this is going to be the object of our inquiry in the next couple of minutes. In fact, we want to argue that multimodal models can only contribute to art historical scholarship if this entanglement of analysis and critique is taken seriously. There cannot exist a visual analysis of images using multimodal models that is not also, at the same time, a critique of the conceptual space inherent in the model. Um, so um, let us demonstrate this uh, for a second. But before we do that, um, we're going to backtrack a little bit maybe and uh, think about how did we even get here uh, in the 10 years that we're talking about. And Leo will do that. 
Oh, uh, yeah, okay. This is always my... I was, I was feeling really, really guilty about uh, this uh, <laughs> slide, which I use all the time. So, um, around the same time of, of Drucker's essay, right, it's about 2012, uh, there was an interview with, with um, Horst Bredekamp, published in the Art Bulletin, and he was asked by Chris Wood what the impact of machines that can read images will be on the history of art. And he answered, I quote, no, it's impossible for machines. Specialists said recently that even in a thousand years, a computer will not be able to recognize the chair painted by Vincent van Gogh as a chair. Computers would need bodies, as the discussion on the corpus schema has shown. That is one of the consequences of embodiment philosophy. Clearly, Bredekamp was ill-advised, um, and we all know, you know that since, well, whatever you want to place it, whether it's 1979 or, or 2015, deep convolutional networks have led to great leaps in the power of machines to recognize objects within images. Um, a number of scholars clearly, including ourselves, including uh, you know, the, the distant viewing lab, have turned this new capacity for detection onto art historical or visual studies problems. In the realm of thing detection, the study of iconographic patterns has benefited from this sort of robustness of pre-trained classifiers, um, especially on figurative works of art. Pose detection, for instance, has facilitated the study of art historical concepts related to gesture. Face recognition has allowed scholars to study the appearance and reappearance of <coughs> historical characters, uh, expressions in the Lebrun thing, as, as, as was being suggested earlier, etc. We group all of these uh, approaches under the umbrella of object recognition really for two reasons. On the one hand, they use that family of machine learning models, which is perhaps slightly wider than the technical definition of object recognition. That is to say, things that are more or less directly derived from symbolic labels, classification models, uh, object, uh, you know, pixel-wise segmentation, etc. On the other hand, and more significantly, all of these approaches attempt to point to semantically unambiguous things, objects depicted in images, right? These models are most often trained on human annotations, and it's sort of assumed that a human observer can verify the model's predictions, you know, as in this case, giving some route into identifying, if not necessarily explaining, any bias in the model. So we can say, you know, it didn't detect this face, it did detect this face, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this form of object recognition, and you know, as with the previous speakers, we're happy to call human limbs objects. Um, it gives us this idea of an unbiased network, which is simply put that which detects all of the faces and the hands and the books and so on correctly. But what modes of understanding, what forms of knowledge does it afford? We have to recognize here that this uh, family of object recognition models have no sense of the relationship between objects beyond that which is encoded in pixel space, right? So if you're learning to solve the MNIST uh, data set of handwritten digits, you don't need to know that the number three lies between the number two and the number four. Any internal relationships are incidental. Um, you can see this in class confusion matrices. We often get models that confuse bird and aeroplane. That's to do with the sky, the blue sky, or in England, the gray sky behind them, not to do with any relationship to flight. Now, this is important to understand the context of the use of internal representations, these so-called embeddings in digital art history. Following the hypothesis that a successful classifier must have obtained at least some useful knowledge about the structure of images, feature extraction uses these selected internal representation to uh, create embeddings of images, so sort of compressed representations of images as seen by the neural network, mostly their late stage uh, neural representations to do with objects, sometimes we get style, uh, representations and so on. Unlike in word embedding models, however, where the distributional hypothesis suggests that word correlation has some sort of semantic implication at scale, you know, we all know man to king is to, you know, is as woman is to queen, etc. Object recognition models have embeddings which are entirely determined by these visual features, right? And that means that the embeddings extracted from object recognition models, so, you know, similarity search, uh, pix plot type maps, etc., ultimately operate from within the confines of a labeled visual world. We would say that these models have a kind of anagraphical embedding logic. Check the time. Okay, we're doing all right. Now, in multimodal foundation models, and you know, the example here is, is CLIP, which is perhaps the most famous, but it's a whole family of models. We're dealing with two interlocking technical developments that we suggest change this relationship. Uh, between embedding, let's say, and uh, 
represented thing. In the first instance, this multimodality, that is to say being trained on text and images, allows models to encode both into a common space. And they learn not from sets of images with discrete categories as in ImageNet, but from pairs of images and texts, and so digital images with descriptive captions. Now, in practice, this means that this internal representational logic, that is the shape, the topography of the embedding space, is informed also by linguistic relations, not solely, but also. And that means that, for instance, the relationship between aeroplanes and birds and flying, between aeroplanes and airports and suitcases, despite there not being this blue sky relationship, are encoded in the embedding space. You know, we, get, we get a different form of visual similarity, whatever that means. The second distinction is one of scale, and I would also add probably something like diversity of representation, because ImageNet was always only photographic. So foundation models basically means models that are extremely large and that can be used or uh, intended to be used for a variety of downstream tasks with minimal uh, fine-tuning or no fine-tuning. So this includes the sort of uh, text models like GPT-3 and so on, trained on previously inconceivable amounts of data. If we compare the, um, the image data set sizes, ImageNet is about 14 million images with 22,000 categories. Um, the most common uh, multimodal models use either 400 million images, as in CLIP, or 5 billion images, the uh, models trained on Lion 5B, and these are image text pairs. So, whereas ImageNet is, again, this diversity entirely trained on photographs, ImageNet is intended to be only photographs, sometimes you get some other things sneaking in. Lion contains drawings, paintings, born digital images, you know, weird memes, and so on. So multimodal foundation models allow for a supplying, surprisingly nuanced exploration of these complex visual complex uh, concepts, rather, which fall out of the conceptual constraints of object recognition. And this affords a new set of practices when working with this kind of visual data. At the same time, it also creates a new urgency for understanding the visual culture of such trained models, precisely because it allows us to ask for more nuanced visual concepts, you know, violence, 70s neighborhood, rhythm, as we'll see, et cetera, that necessarily only exist in a culturally situated way. In other words, it is no longer possible to even imagine, never mind build, this unbiased network. Yeah, so we're going to show you a couple of examples that we think are cool, but then later qualify that again and say, perhaps it's not that cool, uh, actually, and we need to rethink this. But um, so um, one thing that is facilitated by these multimodal models uh, is what the computer scientists call image retrieval, what trivially is basically image search. Um, and it makes it easier to find objects, um, for instance, images of chairs in the Museum of Modern Art, uh, New York collection. Um, so it does match the state of the art in classical object recognition as well. But more importantly, other than in metadata-based retrieval systems um, and in object recognition models, uh, CLIP in particular, uh, through its natural language interface, allows for retrieval based on um, what we call visual concepts, right, of almost arbitrary complexity. And the examples that you're going to see are uh, retrieved or collected with uh, this platform that comes out of a, a collaborative project with my colleague Peter Bell uh, called Images.ai that was uh, Peter presented uh, a couple of days ago. So if you use that platform to search for the concept rhythm um, in the Museum of Modern Art uh, New York collection, which is about 70,000 images, so this is not the whole collection. This is what they have online, right? It's the classical issue of everything images. Um, but if we'll stick with it for a second, if you run this search, you'll get um, some of these images, and they embody a really large spectrum of meaning inherent in the word rhythm, right? So you get images of sheet music, um, album covers, loudspeakers, works that resemble oscilloscope graphs or spectral plots um, on the, on the mid-right here, um, or graphical works that involve um, regular patterns that could be described as somehow rhythmic, right? So we're dealing with image retrieval, which is a trivial task, more or less, but clips takes us um, far beyond the object recognition paradigm in what we can retrieve. And I want to show another brief example that demonstrates this. Um, so the art historians in the room and probably also everybody else will know this painting by Diego Velazquez, uh, Las Meninas from 1656. It's one of the most discussed pictures in art history probably. And it's, uh, art historians like it, um, right? 
um, be, because uh, because it deals um, with representation, right? So even Michel Foucault um, spends a big part of the order of things on talking about this image. Um, and, uh, you know, there's all kinds of things that deal with representation. So the painter himself is in the painting, but we don't see what he's painting. We can only see the backside of the canvas. Um, uh, there's a mirror which opens up another invisible image space in the background. There's countless gaze relations between the people in the image. So you get the idea, right? Now, using the techniques of digital art history so far, what can we say about this picture? Um, we might be able to determine the number of people in the picture um, with the help of a pre-trained or fine-tuned face detection network. We might confirm the existence of certain image objects, an easel, a dog, other paintings um, with a classical object detection network. We might even be able, but this is stretching it already a little bit, right, to estimate the gaze direction of some of the characters in the picture. But what we can't see, or what we can't retrieve in that sense, is that this is an image about representation, right? That it's, in uh, W.J. Mitchell's term, a meta picture, a picture about pictures that tells us something about images. But if we run an images AI search for the title of the painting, Las Meninas, uh, in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art, New York, um, which does not have the painting in its collection, right, it's in the Prado in Madrid, um, we get results that are surprisingly enlightening. Um, we find Richard Hamilton's Picasso's Meninas, which was on the title slide, uh, which is a very direct play on the original painting. But we also get these two photographic works, Joy Marovitz's, um Untitled from the French Portfolio on the left, and Roberta Snow's uh, La Dame in Ligné on the right. And both, as you can see, are you know, ex also explicit plays on representation and on gaze. Um, right? In the right uh, photo, there's a person looking at a painting. Through a shop window, there's another person looking at the person looking at the painting, and so on. So it, it is looking at an image in terms of other images that we are able to capture the conceptual depth that CLIP allows us to access, right? So through other images, we can understand what these models are really capable of. Now the question is, what are potential applications on the one hand, but also what are concrete, significant, and potentially problematic epistemic implications of a system that has learned to understand in big air quotes, or at least operationalize to a degree, complex para-visual concepts in terms of visual attributes. Um, so how can this change the way, going back to Drucker's original kind of like challenge, the way we understand the objects of our inquiry? Yeah, so um, clip scores aren't just useful, obviously, as search engines. You know, we can, we can start to use them as features. Here you can see clip on every couple of frames of Charlie Chaplin's uh, Modern Times, 1936, famous for its gear scenes. So, you know, we search for gears. On the left, you see the kind of rhythm of gears through the frames from the start to the end of the film. On the right, you see the most gear-ish uh, frame, peak gear. Looking for gears, okay, we could have done that with object detection, but you know, Modern Times clearly is also a, uh, a love story. What's the narrative rhythm of Romantic images, you see that on the bottom, romance through time and the most romantic frame, a very different narrative rhythm. But of course here, immediately we open up the difficult question of what kind of image does Clip think of as romantic, right? As banal as that question is, it's clearly much more difficult to pin down than what kind of image it thinks of as gear-like. Now if we assume Let's go back a second to the French examples that Clip's concepts of these things is bound to specific visual properties, gears to gears, romance to people holding hands. We can attempt also to map, perhaps, things to themselves, in this case, a city to itself. Uh, Google Street View uh, images from Paris onto Paris the object. What makes Paris look like Paris to Clip? So here we have... Um, some thousands of images from Google Street View of Paris sampled at regular intervals of latitude and longitude. And uh, all are images of Paris, and yet, of course, not all are equally associated in the visual logic uh, of clip with the prompt, a photo of Paris. Uh, this is a plot, a heat map of that association. We can see that it's spatially uneven. The city center produces the highest associations, landmarks like the Arc de Triomphe down the top right. This is peak Parisianness for Clip. 
Um, images of the wider metropolitan area, the banlieue, et cetera, are significantly lower. And you know, we have been thinking about this, of course, in the last weeks uh, with the, 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 the political events happening. So these architectural elements, urban elements associated with a mental image of Parisness determine Clip's visual model of Parisness, equally, of course, artificial Haussmannian boulevards, et cetera. Much like in the retrieval examples above, we can arrive at a more nuanced idea of Clip's concept of Paris if we compare and contrast it to a second concept, a second major city, Los Angeles. And if we search for Los Angeles, we get the opposite map. Hmm? Periphery is uh, where Los Angeles parts of Paris are to be found, and you can see the most LA part of Paris there on the bottom right. Of course, we can do this with, you know, gardens, graffiti, public spaces, gentrification. You can imagine using these multimodal networks to literally map out urban cultural geographies. At the same time, though, and this is the major point, necessarily mapping the network's culturally situated mental image of gardenness, graffitiness, gentrificationness, etc. Just to finish off, we want to pivot our attention, and both of these examples are online, by the way, they work on the, on the browser to the basic working unit of digital art history, that is to say, the image corpus. Multimodal networks in this way give us a new way of measuring visual phenomenon. We can measure, I should press play here. We can measure, um, we can measure these clip scores effectively as features. But one of the most powerful ways of probing these mental images and to, in a sense, you know, get into the network itself is to focus on the distinctions between a pair of highly entangled concepts, you know, as with Paris itself and Paris the uh, prompt. And this is the intuition between this browser-based visualization called, which we call 2D clip. And in this, two separate clip concepts are mapped against each other. We start to look at correlations. You, know, you can imagine utopian versus science fiction, modernism versus modernity, and so on. Here we have uh, a thousand images from the collection of the Art Institute of Chicago, along with the clip similarities for the term naked and nude, this uh, distinction hotly debated in terms of the male gaze in uh, English, which does not really exist in other major European languages. The concepts clearly are tightly bound up. Uh, we have an almost a uh, perfect correlation, but not everything sits on the precise diagonal. Some things are to the top left, some things to the bottom right. We can't go in now to the nuances of the discussions, you know, John Berger, male gaze, et cetera, but here you see uh, peak nude and peak naked in terms of the distances from that diagonal, and I think we can already imagine here a kind of visual culture for the two concepts that Clip has absorbed. All right, so we're taking away time from your question. So really quickly to just wrap up. Um, the gist of it is before the HL Foundation models and large multimodal models, neural networks did not have an interesting model of human visual culture. Um, today, the makers of stable diffusion um, can, for instance, announce that, this is a direct quote, their model is the culmination of many hours of collective effort to create a single file that compresses the visual information of humanity into a few gigabytes. And that's, of course, still a ridiculous claim to make, right? Um, digitized images are nothing but the tip of the vast iceberg of human image production. Um, and yet, while contemporary visual models are often still not good enough to facilitate those hard technical challenges that AI researchers are actually aiming for, like detecting cancer or driving a car, they now contain so much information about human visual culture that digital art history might be the one discipline where they actually will have an outsized impact. But their usefulness hinges on a re-evaluation what our task kind of is. To put it bluntly, we wanted digital art history and we got digital art history, but it is not what we expected because now we are tasked with really doing the work of analyzing models while we are solving the task that we actually started with. Maybe we'll stop with that. Thank you. Thank you.